I'm kind of happy to get started. Thanks for making the time during your lunch break. Uh, good afternoon, people in Eastern Australia. Good morning, those over in the far west. Um, thanks for coming along. If you're looking for the Climate Systems Hub, welcome webinar. This is it and you're in the right place. Today, um, I'll be speaking. I'm Simon Marsland from the CSIRO and the hub leader of the new Climate Systems Hub. And I'll be joined today by our Climate Adaptation Mission Leader, Sarah Bolter, who is um, based at UTAS, but sitting up in Canberra and our Indigenous facilitator, Rowie Bullio, who is based in Canberra at ANU, but sitting up in Cairns in the far north. I want to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, one of the great things about, I think, the National Environmental Science Program is its strong Indigenous mandate. And I'm on Bunurong lands of the Kulin Nation down here in southeast Melbourne today, where it's a beautiful day and there's some pelicans flying around down near the beach. Beautiful country. And um, I want to pay my respects to the elders past and present of the Bunurong country, which I'm on. I want to extend that up to the um, elders past and present of Ngunnawal country where Sarah is today and also to elders past and present of the Gamoy, Wallabara, Yadinji and Irakanji lands uh, where Rowie is up in the far north um, and extend that to the lands of um, all the lands on which people are joining from today and would we'll ask you to pay your respects also to our traditional owners and elders past and present. Thank you. Uh, take the next slide. It is an exciting time for climate science. Um, you know, it's been decades in the making, the activities of the climate scientists, but um, the focus of the, you know, global policymakers from many, many countries, 197 around the world in the Conference of Parties is firmly on, you know, what might happen next week at the, uh, COP26 Conference of Parties and, um, you know, a, a big event where all nations are making their commitments around climate change and what we're going to do about it. So a um, great time to be starting up the new Climate Systems Hub and uh, bringing the research excellence together that the hub, that the, um, hub partners bring and, you know, really reaching out for that impact on how society responds to what is a really great challenge. And also having that intergovernmental panel on climate change six assessment report, um, the physical basis part one of that just coming out in August also, you know, focusing the world's eyes on where the climate science is at. And I'm really proud that, you know, five of those 234 authors on that report are actually um, researchers in the climate systems hub here with me. So that's, you know, a really exciting time. National Environmental Science Program has been around since 2015, just going into its second phase now. So in the first phase, there were six hubs. Now there'll be four hubs going forth for the next um, seven year period, 2021 to 2027. The Climate Systems Hub uh, led by CSIRO and um, a number of partners, which I'll come to, a resilient landscapes hub led out of the University of Western Australia. Marine and Coastal Hub co-led uh, out of um, the Reef and Rainforest Research Centre up in Cairns and also University of Tasmania down in Hobart and a Sustainable Communities and Waste Hub led out of the University of New South Wales. So four really uh, great investments into the, um, the science around um, environmental science in this country and very grateful to federal government and the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment for funding this quite substantial and major project in Australian environmental science. Check this out. Uh, this is really exciting because with each of the hubs, there's also associated a cross-cutting mission. So for the Climate Systems Hub, it's the Climate Adaptation Mission, and we'll be hearing from the mission leader, Sarah, shortly. Um, there's a Threatened and Migratory Species and Ecological Communities Mission um, led out of the Resilient Landscapes Hub. A protected places mission that's going to you know all kinds of um, places on country, both land country and sea country, um, you know, 
wetlands, uh, bird habitats, etc., and a sustainable communities waste hub, which has a waste impact mission. And what's exciting, I think, about the mission structure, which is something new in NESP in, in its second phase, is it's really starting to explore the linkages so that the hubs aren't standalone things, but you know, all hubs through the missions are working together. Um, in, in um, addressing Australia's um, environmental challenges. And in particular for the Climate Systems Hub and the Climate Adaptation Mission, you know, I hope we find places in all across the NEST program where um, the climate change kind of um, challenges are being addressed through the program. Take the next slide, please, Tony. Our partners, to some extent, they're the usual suspects. If you knew about the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub, which has um, just spun up, a, spun down after six years, Bureau of Meteorology, CSIRO, the five universities, I call them the CLEX universities because they're also the five participating in the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes. So that's Australian National University, Monash, Melbourne, University of New South Wales and University of Tasmania. So those seven partners were all part of the previous Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub and have maintained that partnership going forward into the new Climate Systems Hub. But uh, what I think is also very exciting is this uh, eighth partner we've brought in new this time, and that's through the Interjurisdictional Chief Environmental Scientist. So that's a platform of Chief Environmental Scientists across uh, states and territories in Australia. Uh, they <coughs> run a climate science community of practice and um, through New South Wales Department of Planning infrastructure and an environment uh, leading up in the hub that for that uh, real state and territory presence. So that is, I really think, um, the icing on the cake where we've brought the science excellence in this country in the climate change space together, but we also now have this deep reach through the states and territories um, out to communities and, and down to people on the ground. So that's gonna really help our translation pathway of taking the science outcomes and uh, making meaningful um, policy um, information, providing meaningful policy information, et cetera, to people who are really using it when it comes to the pointy end of addressing the challenges of climate change. Take the next slide, please. So there's several things that are brought to the table through the Climate Systems Hub and the Climate Adaptation Mission. There's the climate adaptation lens. So it's um, not just here's the science, this is what's gonna happen. It's some scary stuff. Maybe there's some opportunities in there as well, but really going to the question of what are we gonna do about it? And that's um, what Sarah's gonna be talking about with the Climate Adaptation Mission. And that's, um, I think, a really nice addition into the NEST program to bring this mission structure. Enhanced national climate resilience, um, you know, that's a very broad thing. It's not just something that the hub does. There's a whole ecosystem of um, science and um, kind of areas. There's a new Australian climate service that was just announced in the previous budget, spinning up, um, working in the emergency management space. There, there's a whole lot of things um, happening in this country, but, you know, I hope the Climate Systems Hub is really where we bring the science excellence to the table to meet those challenges through various mechanisms and partnerships. Speaking of partnerships, a really important one is the Indigenous partnerships. And that's one of the things I really like about um, working in the previous Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub and the mandate we have going forward with the Climate Systems Hub is that uh, strong mandate to work in Indigenous partnerships. And we'll be hearing a little about that from uh, Roe later on in this talk. But, you know, that's really uh, working in that space has, has made me think a lot about, you know, uh, country, connectedness to country, um, the stewardship that traditional owners have had over this land for you know tens and tens of thousands of years. And um, when we have these pretty rapid changes going forward, already happening today, um, how we how we deal with that and, and what we can do to help others deal with that as well, especially uh, the most marginalised in, in, um, in the country who you know, may be feeling the worst effects of climate change quite soon. 
last aspect I want to mention is the co-designed research and that's why we're reaching out to you stakeholders, research users today um, to welcome you to the, um, the new hub and let you know about what we're doing. Co-designed research is really, you know, getting on the front foot of trying to identify user needs before we embark on the science program and it's really um, great to you know bring the stakeholders to the table to make sure that the investment that we're putting into the um, climate science is actually going to be directed and targeted to meet user needs and Sarah will talk uh, um, in more depth about the co-design shortly. Really happy that um, Last Friday, we got the first research plan, Research Plan 2021, approved by the department. And that's very exciting news. It's gone through our steering committee and at close of business yesterday um, was the endorsement close off there. So uh, just signing off a few forms and we're doing the contracting out to our partners now to bed in that first research plan. It's been a little bit slower coming than I'd anticipated. So it's been a long journey to this point in time, but I think that's exciting and that's exciting for all our partners and the, the researchers we've got. We've got um, eight projects in our first year. They're running out from now till end of uh, June next year. The first one, Adapting to Tomorrow's Climate, that really is about the climate adaptation mission and you know um, getting that in a firm place to go forward. So um, spinning up the mission through that project. The second project is um, particularly dealing with Indigenous partnership work. It's also carrying on some previous COVID affected work that was being done towards the end of the Earth System and Climate Change Hub and make sure that those conversations and plans that were started off are not left behind and, and we uh, maintain relationships that have been built in the past as we go forward growing and nurturing and building new relationships um, going forward. Third project, Regional Knowledge for Local Action. That's about climate projections. So that's about uh, taking global modeling, um, taking the downscaled high resolution modeling out of that, and then making real tailored information products that, that meet end user, end user needs in the projection space. There's a project on emerging climate extremes. So that's really at the pointy end of climate change. Um, heat waves, cyclones, um, floods, droughts, all kinds of things that, um, you know, you read about it in the newspaper every day. I don't know if we just have access to more media, but it seems the extremes are happening more. Maybe people are living in more places or there's more of them, but certainly um, climate extremes is, is a huge challenge going forward. Modelling the future, that's about, you know, work we do with um, global models. Access is Australia's um, weather and climate model that um, goes from all scales from your daily weather report out of the Bureau of Meteorology right through to those hundreds of years looking forward um, global climate experiments with scenarios of high emissions or lower emissions or different emission trajectories that society may choose upon um, and having that, that capability and uh, maintaining that capability. There's a project on um, changing oceans, coastal and climate impacts, it includes marine heat waves, uh, many facets of, of the ocean, um, ocean carbon uptake, ocean heat uptake, etc. Uh, there's one on understanding climate variability. So, you know, things are not linear in this world. Climate change is not linear. It's in fact superimposed upon many cycles of variability. And you would have heard of El Nino, Southern Oscillation, Southern Oscillation um, La Nina, et cetera, Indian Ocean, Dipole, Southern Annula Mode, these longer terms of variability that are intrinsic and natural in the climate system. So uh, you need a really firm understanding of that kind of stuff if you're going to um, disentangle out of that exactly what the climate change differences are um, understanding climate variability and then the last one there around carbon and carbon you know it's really central to the climate change story where is it is it uh, where's it going into the land uh, what are the ocean sinks what are the impacts of that especially in the ocean the acidification and, and what that might do to ocean ecosystems as well It was Winston Smith in George Orwell's 1984 who said, 
Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. It's something about information. Before I want to look forward, I just want to step back for a moment to the past because we're building on some great work that's been done through the Earth System and Climate Change Hub. In fact, if you didn't see it, they put out the really nice climate change in a land of extremes synthesis report in June as that hub was winding down. You can Google that up, a beautiful synthesis document. And so we're standing on the shoulders of giants of the work that's been done in the past. But that said, looking forward, you know, we've just got our first uh, research plan 2021. Each year there'll be new research plans as per the NEST process. And um, a really important part throughout the life of the hub is uh, that co-design and that engagement to the people who we've invited here today, the stakeholder and research user community, um, very much a big part of our 2021 plan is the co-design process, which uh, Sarah will be talking about more. And I think at that point in time, I will pass it to Sarah, please. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. I um, really appreciate that introduction. So as Simon has said, uh, one of the really new things about the NEST program this time around is the introduction of the idea of the missions. Uh, these are intended to um, focus research around a particular challenge uh, and it should cut across each of the different hubs. So. Um, Simon mentioned the COP and I think it's worth pointing out that the Paris Agreement included a, a commitment around adaptation. And so it's just as important to be thinking about that in this space as how we reduce emissions. And effectively that commitment is really around ensuring that we are well adapted. And the climate adaptation mission is very much focused on um, how we can ensure that Australia is well adapted to the uh, level of climate change we can expect in the future. So it's thinking about our adaptive capacity, it's, it's thinking about our resilience in response to, to uh, climate change risks. And in terms of what we'll do in the adaptation mission to work towards that goal, there's three things that I wanted to highlight. Um, I guess sort of working into to out a bit. So one of the things we want to see across the NESP is building capacity amongst researchers to really incorporate thinking about adaptation and the climate change challenges in how the activities and research is undertaken. Secondly, we are looking at how we can support you as decision makers and policy makers in undertaking adaptation. Um, we understand that that is very much um, uh, on the front of mind for a lot of um, decision makers at the moment. It's a complex space. It requires quite a lot of thinking about values and risk and choice. And so our plan is to build research and activities um, in collaboration with our stakeholders that are very much about how can we support you to uptake and apply um, evidence-based data, how can we provide information and management tools that will really support the process of adapting to climate change and making decisions around what's appropriate, appropriate in terms of adaptation for your region or your community, your state. And then um, underpinning that is really ensuring that we're able to undertake research across the hub that's not just focused on a particular area, it's really integrated across what we do in, in the NESP program. So we want to see adaptation focused research that really um, underpins the, the holistic approach that adaptation demands when thinking about climate change risks to different communities or places. Um, there's lots of research questions that we could undertake in thinking about that integrated um, research and we are through the co-design process currently um, thinking about that and exploring that. We've already undertaken a number of conversations with different stakeholders to begin to, to think about that. But it's a, an ongoing and um, very much develop, developing process that will occur across the hub, the life of the hub. But, but a few of the things that we're already thinking about is um, how can we assess what it is that we are currently doing in Adaptation Australia and thinking about what that means in terms of best practice. Um, we already have a number of years under our belt of trying a number of different approaches and I think it's useful to do a little bit of reflection to try and help support how we go forward. Some things have worked well, um, some things have stalled and it's really timely I think to look at that and think about what best practice might look like. 
Um, I think also there's an opportunity to help develop further tools and support for undertaking vulnerability assessment, but also for um, making decisions around adaptation. There are quite a lot of um, tools already out there in some areas, but other areas or sectors that that's less so. So it's really about how can we consolidate that approach and ensure that users are getting the support they need to undertake those processes. And then finally, I feel it's really important that we uh, foster a community of practice. And that's an opportunity to develop those linkages across um, research and practice, but also within practice itself, that opportunity to learn from one another about what works and doesn't work um, in, a, in an environment that's supported by good research and good evidence, I think is a really useful thing in adaptation. It's, it's really very much um, a process that requires thinking about your individual situation. And so being able to to provide that environment to support that, I think is a, a useful thing that the mission can do. I just want to reflect a little bit on the co-design approach. So um, Simon introduced this um, at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, it's important to say that the hub is very much committed to um, doing our work in a co-design um, fashion. Um, that's uh, that's always a challenging um, approach, I think, for a lot of people. It, it doesn't necessarily always work easily, but I think it's definitely the way that we can make sure that what we deliver see, suits users' needs um, as best as we possibly can. And it's worth mentioning, we're doing that in a way that speaks to four principles of co-design. Uh, one is around sharing power. So we are keen to make sure that we work with users in a way that, that um, it, that acknowledges that there is information and knowledge and experience on both sides, both the research side and the practice side, and both equally need to be brought together to, um, to put forward good research and um, support good adaptation activities. The second is around prioritising relationships. We're very uh, much committed to building good relationships and Rowena will talk in a moment about her role in that in building partnerships with um, Australia's First Nations people. And that's really around building trust and connection. Um, it needs to be supported by participatory approaches. Um, we don't want it to be death by workshop, but I think it's important that we make sure that in what we do, we use approaches that allow the voice and shares that power and builds those relationships across that. And then finally, we're in, we, we expect it to um, build capacity and that's on both sides, both the research side and the practice side, where we're looking at um, making sure that we're learning from one another as we go through this process. And so, the expectation is that co-design approach will lead us through the life of the hub. In the initial um, scoping, starting up planning of the hub, we have created a, a slightly more um, tailored approach to thinking about co-design and we're currently working through that at the moment. We've um, designed it in four steps, um, which we hope makes sense and they're, they're focused on how we can understand what, what's needed and develop things that will meet those needs. So we're beginning with engaging, we're really asking those questions, questions to users and stakeholders around what's needed, what's already happening, uh, where are there gaps, where are there opportunities that, that might shape our research. Um, we, we've currently or just recently gone through a process of analysing that very early engagement and understanding to think about where are their priorities? Where are their key focus areas? Um, how can we think about organising research in a way that speaks to those user needs? Um, we're just beginning to undertake the co-plan stage where we're really starting to think about more deeply about user needs, what could be key outcomes, um, what are the key questions and, and needs, and think about what projects we could develop that would speak to those needs. And then uh, we will work in a more focused way around potential projects to work with stakeholders to really design exactly what those projects look like to make sure that they're meeting um, the outcomes that, that we've set up. And so that's the process, that's sort of the stage at where we're at at the moment. Um, some of you may have been engaged with some of that. Some of you might be waiting, hoping to, to be involved in that. Um, we're really building up that capability to do that at the moment and really look forward to having an opportunity to engage uh, with uh, users and stakeholders um, in a way that's both effective and rewarding, I think, for both um, the NEST research team, but also the users that we, we hope to support.
So I'm going to hand over to Rowena now. Um, she's going to give you a little bit more information about the uh, Indigenous Partnership, which is a really important part of what we're doing in this hub. Thanks, Rowena. Thank you, Sarah and Simon and Tani. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge the Creator through the teachings of my elders uh, in paying respect to the Gimui Wallabara Yadinji and Irikanji people whose land I come through today. I'm a Torres Strait Island woman from uh, Mabiok St. Paul and uh, in the western of Torres Strait and Mare Murray Island in the east. This is um, such a great opportunity to be a part of this very new way of um, uh, focusing on traditional owners um, through the, the NESP uh, Climate Systems Hub, uh, through free, prior and informed consent, Indigenous cultural um, uh, intellectual property is a big thing in this new hub and for all the hubs um, under NESP. Thank you. So I just want to first say that um, this role commenced, the uh, Indigenous facilitator role commenced in the, on the 20th of September uh, this year and um, through one of our partners, Australian National University, I'm employed through, um, and the branch is the First Nations portfolio. So I just wanted to acknowledge Professor Peter Yu, who's the Vice President of the um, uh, First Nations portfolio branch and, um, and, and very thankful for the opportunity to um, to be a part of that, uh, that new and exciting um, First Nations portfolio. I'm, um, as Simon said, I'm employed through the um, Australian National University, uh, working for the Climate Systems Hub, and I'm based in Cairns, and I'm also thankful for the Marine and Coastal Hub, uh, Reef Rainforest and Research Centre, where I'm co-located. So thank you for that support. Um, it's been a, it's been, quite hectic and the, the high level Indigenous stakeholder engagement um, has, has, has been amazing with the uh, key institutions and traditional owners from various parts of the country and learning from them in this early stage of um, their threat to, to country in relation to the consequences of, of climate change in those um, various areas. So, um, that's been, a, that's been a very interesting um, uh, journey coming into the hub, particularly because it's a new way of doing business uh, with traditional owners, uh, with the, the science and the research um, community. And um, so it's been one of building relationships, particularly internally with the hub partners, uh, building indigenous capability, and, um, and building that relationship of confidence and trust as we go forward in this, in this co-design stage. So under the, um, the NEST principles for Indigenous partnerships, our uh, practice are informed uh, by that and by our Indigenous engagement strategy. Um, so the, you know, the big one that I mentioned before is right to Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And it's, and it's nothing new in terms of you know, what our um, elders, our old people and, and people fight for and key institutions and indigenous people in the country have, uh, have pushed for this for, for, many, for many years. And, um, and we're grateful to be a part of it. I am grateful to be a part of it at the moment, building on from the former Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub, uh, particularly the National First Peoples Gathering um, on, on climate change, uh, was an amazing opportunity to work with in that, in that area. So we're building on that. And, um, and every community is different. Cultural protocols are absolutely important. So in this co-design um, phase of reaching out to partners has been a really uh, rewarding time and people are reaching out, traditional owners are, are reaching out um, to work with the NESP. And, um, and we, as we go through our co-design and um, um, stages. Um, all through that, Indigenous-led governance, um, co-created research. And the thing that Sarah had said before around those um, uh, four principles of co-design and sharing power is a big thing because um, that was, you know, that was not, um, uh, it wasn't inclusive in, in past times. We have a really great opportunity now in the way we do business with our traditional owners um, within this multiple knowledge system of sharing and caring for country. Um, so that's 
I think that's pretty much it, really. Um, Simon, I'm going to give it back to you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Rowena, and thank you very much, Sarah. <clears throat> Respect. It's a beautiful thing. I think we can all learn a lot from uh, First Nations people especially in Australia and Torres Strait about respect. It's so um, an ingrained part of the culture and I think it's a really beautiful thing. I miss you all. I don't know who you are. I can't see you. It's a strange format. I'd love to be in the room with you, but um, we're going to open it up now to um, questions. There's a um, Q&A tab on the bottom of the screen there, we've already got a few questions come through. Ironically, they're all from anonymous attendees. So I don't know if that's just one person who has that name, but I'm going to assume it's a variety of people who I can't see. And um, the first one was, um, can we explain more about the co-designed research and what sort of principles and mindsets have been explored in this aspect? And that was posted at 1.13 p.m., which was about five minutes before Sarah started talking. And she went directly to those principles of co-design, mentioned the sharing of power, prioritising of relationships, the participatory approach and the building of capability. But Sarah, did you want to add any more? You've been given the chance there. <laughs> um, thanks, Simon. Um, what more would I add? I guess the main thing is, is that, um, you know, like, I think what we're trying to elevate in the hub is that this is really an important value for us and that we recognise that for our science to be successful, it is important that we um, engage and we engage in a meaningful way. Um, I think that they're in, in the sort of hurry of developing a lot of our new knowledge, sometimes it's, it's easy to um, assume that what we produce in terms of science is useful um, without taking time to test that assumption. And so that's very much a part of what the co-design is looking for in the hub is to really understand if um, what we see as valuable as, as scientists, in fact, is valuable um, to our to stakeholders or those who are really, you know, uh, where the rubber hits the road, road if you like, really un trying to undertake decisions and, and make policies and undertake um, management um, to make sure that, that the information is in a format that A, it's the information that's needed, and then B, it's in a way, it's presented in a way that's most useful for making those decisions. Thanks for that, Sarah. Um have another question here. How will the research questions be explored and prioritised, particularly for a co-design approach? And that's a really great question because um, there's the issue of capacity. There is um, a certain amount of funding and a certain amount of people involved and a certain amount of hours in the day, yet the challenges are huge to the nation and very many in the climate and the environmental spaces. So um, we, you know, in terms of uh, prioritisation, I guess there's several steps. There's harvesting the needs through stakeholder discussions, and Sarah's been doing a lot of that. Then there's actually digesting it back at um, the scientists' end of what we're capable of and where we can focus and cluster and target research best. And some of that process we've already been stepping through. Sarah's led a lot of meetings with um, with stakeholders. Uh, we've last week, maybe two weeks ago now, ran a co-design workshop internally in the hub where we started to take all that information that we've harvested and started to try to um, grow group it into themes and think about, you know, what goes together, uh, who's asking for what, where are the priorities. Um, there's a number of stakeholders we've got to consider, you know, we've got federal government, we've got state governments down to, you know, local government areas. We've also got um, the traditional owner Indigenous partnerships communities with priorities. We've got the research community as well with priorities and, um, you know, there's that whole lens there. We can't do anything. There has to be some prioritisation, but um, I guess it's an iterative process. I don't know, um, is Sarah, if you want to comment on that or Roe from the Indigenous aspect? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's a really important question and, and the, the challenge is to try and look at that range of 
potential research that could be done and, and find ways of being smart about how we do that. I think as a national research organisation, we need to look at questions that can get um, outcomes that suit a range of users. And that's, I think, how we look at prioritising the, the research. Um, I think in, in practical terms and what we're doing at the moment, you know, we have quite a lot of information that we've gleaned from various conversations around what research questions could be. Um, we're sort of reflecting on that at the moment internally, as Simon has said, to think about, you know, what type of research we could do that might speak to those questions. And then it's really about kind of going back to users and testing if you know what we feel that we're able to do meets those need and then work together to really design the research in a way that delivers the best outcomes that we can. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, yeah, thanks, um, Sarah. And, and I support what Sarah just said. And the whole thing um, with the Indigenous partnership is all about um, the relationship and, and the approach that we have um, with our um, traditional owners throughout the country. So we've been, you know, having some conversations with former members of the uh, National First Peoples um, uh, Gathering on Climate Change Steering Committee members and some key people. So there's a whole lot of discussions going and we want to get this right um, with those research questions and, and the relationship is, um, is paramount in the Indigenous space. Thanks. Thanks, Rowie. Uh, here's one about what will the role of the NEST and Climate Systems Hub be in relation to the, ship, relation to the Australian government's new net zero policies. Uh, as always, it's the job of the hub to provide the best science um, information it can to policy makers to inform how they go forward with policy. One from uh, Kevin Hennessy, what's the difference between research, research outcomes? What's the difference between research outcomes undertaken by CLEX and the NASP Climate Systems Hub projects on climate extremes and climate variability. Um, so that's the uh, CLEX, the University Centre of Excellence I mentioned earlier versus the Climate Systems Hub um, in the extremes and climate vari variability spaces. So what are the differences? Um, yeah, it um, comes down, I think, Kevin, to um, what we can do, bringing research partners together, addressing questions at scale. But um, obviously, I think there's actually a lot of uh, synergies um, between what CLEX would do in climate extremes and what might come up in climate extremes and climate variability projects. So it's probably not the best answer, but um, yeah, um, I'm very happy to be working with those CLEX universities through the hub and through CLEX itself for that matter. But, um, ov obviously, we can't have things being paid for twice, so I hope you know we're enhancing and adding new opportunities into that space. Got a question from Sonia Bloom, who was the uh, communications officer in the previous hub. How will the Climate Systems Hub and Climate Adaptation Mission interact with the other hubs and missions under NESP? Sarah, would you like to have a crack at that kind of cross-hub interaction? Cross-organisation in interaction. Yeah, look, thanks, Sonia. That's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a um, uh, tricky space at the moment because, you know, we're busy uh, understanding what, what is needed from our, our own perspective. Um, there is an intention and there's goodwill around work or working together. The expectation is that each of the... Um, hubs will undertake um, projects that meet the strategy and desired outcomes and outputs of the each of the missions. So we're currently in the process of writing our mission strategies. Um, and we will use that to guide the research that's desired from each of the hubs or prioritised for each of the hubs. So for example, um, for the climate adaptation mission, um, there's certainly been a, quite a number of conversations we've had which are around uh, the impacts of climate change on different species and also building frameworks for undertaking vulnerability assessment and building adaptation plans. And so that's something that we can certainly work with the Resilient Landscapes Hub in bringing together some of the information from the Climate Systems Hub and the expertise that exists in the Resilience Landscape Hub to undertake a project that's really looking at adaptation in some of those um, areas of conservation or where there's a need for um, uh, 
uh, managing landscapes and ecosystems. Thanks. Oh, yeah, go on, Rowie. Yeah, no, Please. just very quickly, I, I failed to mention actually about the, um, uh, the other Indigenous facilitators in those four hubs, which is really, um, you know, the whole, the, the holistic um, uh, way we are with uh, traditional owners. So we have an Indigenous facilitation network that's um, uh, facilitated by the, the NESP Indigenous um, Knowledge Broker, the DOOR in Indigenous Knowledge Broker. And, uh, and that's, um, that's a, a development at the moment that uh, I think is pretty exciting. So, so the, the cross um, collaboration with those other hubs um, is an exciting um, space at the moment with uh, discussions with the uh, other Indigenous facilitators and um, the, hub, the hub, their hubs, respective hubs and door. Thank you. Thanks, Rowie. Um, I'm cognizant that we're running out of time and we've got quite a few questions. We probably won't be able to get them to them all in the allotted time. But here's one from Aaron at, uh, Coot Smith at, at DPI. What are the linkages and relationships between the Climate Systems Hub and the Australian Climate Service? That's something we're still teasing out, Aaron. I think um, in terms of getting spun up, the Climate Systems Hub is a little bit ahead of the Australian Climate Service at this point in time, but uh, we've certainly had a number of discussions with ACS around uh, forming linkages. You know, what are some of the differences there? I guess I could address that as well. Um, you know, currently the ACS has a fairly narrow um, customer focus base in the emergency management area, um, whereas the Climate Systems Hub, I think, has a much broader environmental spectrum of stakeholders whose needs we have to address. But there are certainly very strong linkages with CSIRO and Bureau of Meteorology both being um, strong partners in both. Um, there's plenty of opportunity to explore those linkages and we are trying to explore them as we move forward. I'm going to start bringing it to an end there. And I'm sorry for those who still have questions in there, but they haven't been answered. Um, feel free to reach out to us. Neil Holbrook, thank you for uh, further addressing Kevin's question around um, CLEX and um, you know, some of the nuances of, of focus between CLEX and the Climate Systems Hub. That's appreciated. I want people to know that this isn't the um, last time we hope to see you. We plan to be running uh, a series of webinars, you know, over the life of the hub. The next one slated, and it will be before end of the year, is the co-design uh, webinar we'll be running. And um, that QR code there, I, I assume you know how to contact us, or I hope you're already on our email list if you are here, but um, there's a QR code or from the website um, you can also find information how to get in contact with us and stay in contact with us. And um, that would be really welcome. So once again, I wanna thank you all for making some time out of your lunch break today. I'm really happy that we're launching the new hub officially. The research plan 2021 is approved and in progress. And we've got our beautiful new website. Thanks Tani and the team for putting that together and getting everything ready in time so that just a few days after we had our approvals we could run this nice webinar and um, be looking in ship shape condition going forward so thank you everybody thank you